Life is very easy if you find the easiest route to positivity. Life is very difficult if you take the negative route towards an aspired vision. Yes, I think we have gone live. Um, I'm going to start with a video just while we um, wait for everybody to join us online. Uh, this is our second Disability Mojo Facebook Live broadcast. And welcome to everybody out there. Um, we've got a few guests in the room with us today. And as everybody knows, um, our king is in the house, um, Musa <laughs> Zulu. Musa, welcome and thank you so much for coming to inspire us with your special kind of disability mojo. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. And to everybody everybody that is joining us right now, let's have a good time. We have an hour to just blow ourselves away with motivation. Exactly. Mojo, yes. um, um, Musa, I'm going to hand over to you fairly quickly. Um, I don't yes. think you need much introduction, and I think you're going to do it yourself. But um, just to say that I think if there is somebody that changes the way people think and experience disability, it is you. Um, Thank you. For not me. because you deny the difficulties in disability, but because you see the magic that sometimes comes with it. And if we seek for it, we find it. So I want us to start by you just explaining what does disability mojo mean to you and how do you use it? Over to you. Well, they take it this way. I've come to realize that people that accept never really change, but people that embrace are the ones that are always going to be uh, not only just welcoming change, but making it possible for other people as well. My mojo is that motto of never really accepting anything, but embracing it. People who accept take things as they are and they, and they say, well, it has been given to me. And the moment you say, well, what can I do about it? It has happened, you have killed the module. But if you embrace, you take it as it is and apply it such that it benefits you, your surroundings and other people around you. That's how I would answer that question. Thank you. Um, in your lives, before and after you became disabled, because you remain the same, Musa, mm. what, or how have you used your mojo to overcome roadblocks? What did some of those roadblocks look like and how did you overcome them? Again, I'm going to go back to my introduction. You are never going to overcome anything if you accept things as they are. But if you embrace, then you go over preaches. There have been times when I also got stuck. And it was during those times that I discovered that it's because I was accepting that this is how things are. But the moment I shifted gear into embracing, I, I, you, you can't stop me. Mm -hmm. You can't stop me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I even worry, not only just about people with disabilities, but about South Africans in general. I think when 1994 happened and we went to the polls to vote, for the new dispensation, we almost accepted that this is how things are going to be now. And the problems that are bedeviling us in the country right now emanate from exactly that uh, way of doing things, where you just simply accept, well, we have been free, what else? Freedom comes just like any other experience with its own challenges. And such challenges have to be met head on and people that accept never really meets those uh, challenges head on. If South Africans could start embracing this uh, democracy that we all fought for and died for, there's so much that this country would see, which will be positive changes towards a, a society for all. So it's not only about disability or even trauma where we're supposed to apply this philosophy. It's a life philosophy. It's the continuity of things Otherwise, they never continue if we simply accept that they have happened and then what? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important how you 
relate um, you becoming disabled with the country being liberated and then not really working hard enough to, to, to give life to the opportunity that it presents. Um, you know, Lydia, mm -hmm. I, I always say, sorry to cut you. I always say to people I was paralyzed at the right time. And what do I mean by paralyzed at the right time? I was paralyzed exactly a year after South Africa went to the polls. It was a new era for all of us. And when I got paralyzed, I simply applied the very same philosophy to say, if life is changing, why would I not change with it? Mm -hmm. And amazingly, 26 years after democracy and 26, 27 years after democracy and 26 years after I was paralyzed, just holding on to that philosophy has made me change with society. And when you change with society, you, um, you can't ever think, so sorry about that. No problem. You, you, can't, you can't ever think that time has passed you by. That's the other thing about people that accept. Because they accept and they sit still, time passes them by. And before they know it, so much has happened that they were not a part of. To embrace means literally going with the flow, but not allowing the flow to determine your direction. You allowing the flow to take the direction that you want it to take. That's how I've just lived my life. And I've discovered that in so doing, I have not only just succeeded, but everything around me has also recorded its own successes because we're doing these things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, have a, you have a wonderful way in how you describe what I call dis bubbles. You know, you always say yeah. this disempowerment, disability, um, yeah. disengagement. I call them the dis bubbles. And, mm. and we need to burst the bubbles of negativity that surrounds disability. Um, mm. Share with us your philosophy around it and what some of those dis bubbles that you had I'm, to I'm, burst. I'm, I'm a very positive person. And uh, positivity also begins with the language that you speak. Most of the time, negative people will also have a negative language in terms of uh, defining their experiences or even entering into relationships with other people. I do not like words that begin with the DIS because they, are, they connote the negative. Disabled, disempowered, disenfranchised, disallowed, you hook, you hook yourself on those DISs, a lot is not going to, 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 to happen to take you forward. I remember one day set for interviews at the University of Natal and we're interviewing uh, young students that wanted to, to, to get a bursary from Hexagon Trust. This was a long time ago before your NSFASIS. And this child kept on just going back to the DIS, I am disadvantaged. I come from a, a community that was disenfranchised. And I, I just stood up and said, well, well, I'm in a wheelchair, but I stood up to stand up. <laughs> to stand up does not necessarily mean that a person in a wheelchair can, I cannot stand up. I stood up and I said, do you really think you are impressing anyone with these DISs? How are we, because before you know it, people that always uh, go towards the DISs are disliked. She, she was shocked. And I said, be careful of those words because that DIS is literally going to equate to dislike. We're not going to, 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 to like anything that you're all about. Because you're not telling us. And people that always talk uh, in, in the negative do not necessarily tell you anything about themselves, but about circumstances and how those circumstances have relegated them to the DISs. So when doctors told me that I was disabled, I mean, very rarely do I ever refer to myself as a person with a disability. In fact, the word disability is not one of those words that are part of my, uh, what they call this, uh, part of my vocabulary. The, the, the relationship between people with impairments and society, which causes the disability, how would you recommend that people with impairments um, relate to themselves in terms of the burden society places on them? I'm saying again, we were, we're going to have to take it back to the South African experience. Do you remember that the oppressed changed the regime and freed themselves? I think the very same responsibility sits on the lap of people with disabilities to liberate themselves. 
How do they do that? Number one, by meeting as a sector to really start interrogating some of the stereotypes that society has burdened us with. And you'll be amazed that some of these stereotypes have gone unchallenged and as a result have found a life and thrived. In order to change society, it's people, societies do not change on their own. It's people that change society. Number one, by wanting to be the change that they want to be. I still have to ask people with impairments or people with disabilities if they've really come to define the change that they want to see or if they are the change that they want to see. I guess I cannot answer that question. It would have to be the sector that sits down to really say, what are our aspirations in terms of the change that we want to see in as far as our circumstances are concerned? Then sit down to table all of these stereotypes that society, as I say, has overburdened us with, taking them one by one themselves before even confronting society to say, a particular stereotype we've debated and really think does not sit well with us. And we mm -hmm. do not think that it sits with, well with us because of one, two, and three. I cannot give you the one, two, and three. It's the sector that would have to do that. Because that's the only, that's the only way you can ever change anything, by changing yourself first. And if okay. it were not for the oppressed that sat down and say, we want our freedom, and defined what their freedom was to, to a point of even drawing this constitution that governs us today, unless people with disabilities do so, they are never really going to be writing any constitution about their lives going forward. Mm -hmm. In other words, we must be the change we want to see. We must live our truth. If we live the truth of society, that's where we will stay. Because at the end of the day, uh, Lydia, I would not be where I am today. And all of us would not be where we are today if we did not push it towards that perspective or towards that end. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask some of the guests that's in the room with us, Alex or Tebelo, um, Notugela, um, whether any of you have questions for Musa or comments. I'm going to open it, unmute yourself, switch your videos on, and let us engage with, with, with Musa. I'm also following on Facebook in case there are people that um, have comments, and then I will um, pass those comments on. Hi, I'm not okay. together. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, not together. I am from the Not Together Foundation. But Musa, yes. you just said something very interesting that if we want to change um, the narrative about us, hmm. we have that responsibility to get together dialogue and make a way where we define how we want our society to see us. What platform do you suggest this should be done? All systems go when it comes to self-definition. We can write books that say exactly who we are. We can go to Facebook and define exactly who we are media in its various uh, formations, including just making it a point that wherever we are, we introduce ourselves. You know, Lydia, let me tell you something. Do you know that people without disabilities would be shocked if you were to call them the able bodied at all times? Why do we allow people to be calling us disabled and still think that we have been introduced? I'm telling you, society would never take it if you were to start talking about everybody, the enabled, the, 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 the abled, the abled bodied, people would say, well, but why, why do you have to be saying that? Call us by our names, or at least just say those people. But people with disabilities have just allowed everybody to be introducing them in this negative. To change the narrative literally means get, grabbing the narrative by the balls. I'm sorry to say so. Grabbing the narrative <laughs> by the balls and shooting it across your direction. When it comes to myself and my life, and I believe that this should apply to every other single person, including my children, I tell them the same. Never treat yourself with kid clubs. Always make it a point that you are, the, you, you, you are your best opponent. Knock yourself out sometimes just to make a point. And I am saying, in a society, can you hear me now? 
Yes, I can I can hear you. Mm -hmm. In an unforgiving society, you cannot be treating yourself with kid gloves. Make it a point that you box yourself out so that when you face society itself, you are stronger and can always defend yourself. I sometimes think everybody is, is very kind to themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alex, I'm going to hand over to you, your comment or question. Thank you, Lydia. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Musa, for coming and gracing us with your wisdom this afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Everyone can hear me? Okay, thank you. I'm just my takeaway from what Musa has been saying is I like the concept of self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. Disability is a difficult issue to deal with. And we have enough pity and ah shame from society. So we need to be able to accept ourselves and who we are. Accept ourselves with the changes that are happening in our lives when we acquire disability. Accept yourself and love yourself enough to know that being disabled does not mean that your life has ended. It does not render, render your life futile or useless. So when you accept yourself, you begin the process of self-introspection because you need to reach deep within yourself to find out from yourself how you are going to now live and cope with this new disability that you have now acquired. So it becomes very important to draw from your own strength, to draw from your own abilities, and to draw from even life experiences that you've had before your disability. And those are able to propel you forward so you can rise again and start looking at life and start empowering yourself and start moving forward. So self-acceptance is very key and very important for us to cope because now when we stand strong, on our own two feet, even if you're in your wheelchairs, Musa says that there's no reason that he's not standing because he's sitting on a chair. So you stand strong from within, and that way you can be able to move forward and be able to empower others and take others with you on your, on your self-discovery and self-empowerment journey. So thank you very much for sharing with us, Musa. And Lydia, thank you for arranging this module session for us. Thank you. Look, is that thank Alex you. Is that Alex Msichana? That's Alex Msichana, one of our 1976 detachment um, activists. Alex, I'm so happy. Just the other day, she received books uh, that she bought from me. We talk about life and what makes life tick. We have spoken about uh, self-acceptance or self-embracing. With that comes a, a whole lot of gifts from people who then want to push you forward. You know, Lydia, when people buy my books, like Alex, Alex has the whole collection of my books. I start thinking to myself, had I not embraced this, I would not have a beautiful story to tell people. And I would not have every one of these people supporting me the way that, 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 that people do. I, I'm not a self-made man. The only thing that I ever did was embrace the situation so that at least I have a positive story to tell to those around me. And if at all God was going to give me children, which he later did, a, sto a positive story to tell my children. But a positive story that is then embraced by others to a point of putting me where I am today literally tells me that life has been a blessing to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Musa, let's go into your book. Um, you've, you've had a series of books and you've now, I think, published the mother of all books. Um, <laughs> I, I need help to carry the book from the coffee table into my arms. Um, but it is so filled with experiences and wisdoms um, and, and disappointments at places, but you never linger very long on those. Tell us where, why this monster of a book, quite a lot of long time before you're going to cross over into another world. What does this book mean to you? It, it, it had to be big. I mean, even the title itself should tell you that you are, you, are, you, are, you are now dealing with something very big. 
I am at. I mean, to make a statement like that, you had better be in a position of filling those pages with artistry, not only in terms of drawing, but also in terms of language. And remember, I started drawing in 1979, which is why it's called the 40th anniversary essay. So in 2019, I was already uh, celebrating four decades uh, as a creative artist. And to cover four decades uh, in something like 100 pages, there's a lot that you're going to be leaving out. So I just wanted to pour, pour, it, pour, pour it all out. And remember that uh, fortunately for me, this was happening shortly before 2020. And 2020 is hindsight vision. In other words, where you sit and reflect on things after they've happened. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And 2020 was also my 25th uh, anniversary in the wheelchair. And I needed to celebrate that by, by, by talking about it and everything that has happened in the 25 years. So I knew when I was starting this book, uh, and remember, I did not start it in 2020. To write a book like that means you have been collecting all information, research, whatever that has been written about yourself and, and your work, what people have said, people's opinions about uh, some of your creative outputs from motivational talks to the artwork that I've drawn for almost everybody in South Africa. So the, the, the book is, is, is a body of work that is not only just my mind and about the things that have happened to me, but also what other people say about the things that I do and how far it has taken them, not only in terms of their own changes, but also in terms of how they view disability. As I said, right from the beginning, it is us that will change these opinions. I'm at the 40th anniversary essay is probably the best book that I've ever written. Many people have always said the best book that I ever penned was uh, the language of me. I, I honestly do not think so. I think it came at the right time when South Africa had just started making uh, inroads towards a, a well-defined uh, disability policy. And people were looking at the book as a life experience that uh, society was uh, starting to, 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 to embrace and even uh, draft policies towards its, uh, what you call this thing, its empowerment. But I don't think the language of me was anything like wheels on the sole of my shoes, which followed in, 20, in, in 2008. The language of me was a straightforward story. Maybe people loved it because I poured out all of my emotions. But wheels on the sole of my shoes was uh, about unpacking my mind. What exactly goes through my head when I'm doing an artwork? How do I go about, uh, what do you call this thing, developing a motivational module? And how do I think a motivational speaker should be poised in, in, in order to inspire the audience with both words and action? And I strongly believe that that book was way better than, than the language of me, but people did not give it a chance because it was not pouring out any, any, any emotions to a point. I mean, people will tell you that they were reading the language of me and crying and laughing and hugging each other and kissing. You were not going to be crying and kissing anybody with wheels on the sole of my shoes because it was about the philosophy of my life and how I go about doing things. I then wrote Mastering the Art of self -motiva Mastering the Art of Self-Motivation in 2017 which i also think was really i'm sorry Bobness, i'm losing you oh i'm losing you again yep can you hear me now yes i can hear yes i then uh, followed it up with uh, mastering the art of self-motivation in 2017 and i think that book was way better than the language of me or even wheels on the sole of my shoes because it was about taking an hour and stretching it out into 116 pages what do I mean by taking an hour and stretching it out into 116 pages? Mastering the art of self-motivation, uh, of, of mastering the art of self-motivation is actually a motivational talk. And all of it structured in such a way that it, 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 it develops itself into a book. Now take all of those three books and combine them together without necessarily quoting things as you had put them on their pages. And then you have, uh, I, I'm at the 40th anniversary essay, which takes all of this and bundles it together into the philosophy of everything that I am. But the difference with this one is all of those three books that I wrote before were about me and my mind. This one is no longer about me and my mind as I've already indicated. It's also about how other people 
have developed their own minds about what I do. Yes, I think it is the magic in that everybody whose lives have crossed your life find the space in I am art. Oh, um, I you know, to write because as I said, I'm not a self-made man. A lot of what I have become today is as a result of another person passing me opportunity. And mm -hmm. I needed to say thank you to those people. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, God willing, I, I would literally go everywhere to everyone that has been quoted in that book and say to them, thank you very much for allowing me to write this. Because it's their words that have literally filled up the pages. Mm -hmm. And what's next for Musa Zulu? What's next for me? Mm -hmm. Can I be honest with you, Lydia? I think what's next for me is to take a break and really start enjoying life. I was never a rich man, never really had a pot of gold. I think this time around, I, I, I should follow the rainbow and find my pot of gold. There's so much that I've done in my life, Lydia. And a lot I did, I, I, I did for my own benefit first. I must be very honest with you when it comes to that one. With me, I come first. Because if I can satisfy myself, then I can always be of help to another person. But I think this time around, I would love to go back to them, just be selfish and say, well, we've done a lot. I mean, honestly, I've done a lot. Mm -hmm. People have done a lot for me too. Maybe it's just about time to, to cover new paths towards, as I say, a pot of gold, be rich for once. Also just take time to sit with my children. I've, I, I, I was never an absent father, but I must be very honest with you. Even when I was in the room, there was always something in my mind. I would love to empty my mind and really just start enjoying life and my children. And sometimes these life experiences that I've had, uh, which is why it was also beautiful writing, I, I, I am at uh, the, the 40th anniversary essay, because I got to revisit some moments that passed at a blink of an eye which were very important to my evolution, but I never really got to suffer them. I think when I say it's time for me to, to find my pot of gold, I'm not literally, I'm not talking about money or anything like that, but I'm talking about literally coming back to life and enjoying these things as they happen uh, in, 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 instead of, 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 of only finding time to, to, to write about them and make sense out of them. So that is what is next for me. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a completely a, a completely free life where things happen without me having to worry about any other things no more. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what we've learned from your life, Musa, is life doesn't happen to Musa Zulu. Musa Muzulu makes life happen to him. Uh, you, you set a goal and you go on a path and as you take that path, you take people along because you know that's where your resilience also lie. But you don't allow life to just happen to you. Um, you you make life happen to you. And so so, so I think from that perspective, um, the there's just a one or two comments. Nomtandazo Mpande says, you're a motivator to many. Um, and, and I think it's something that we really need to savor. Um, that that you that that your lessons your books your talks your existence inspires and motivates not only people with disabilities but i think society as a as a whole and as you started in the beginning by saying 1994 could have been so much better if we really worked at it but we allowed it to happen to us as a country and what came afterwards instead of really us making it happen for us um there's a there's another question another nice tricky question to close with um from washila um states and she says what would be your um suggestions around the current COVID 19 crisis and the way in which people with disabilities have when it suited government just been seen as part of the oblivious um, instead of a vulnerable group. But when it suits government, we become a vulnerable group. Um, what would be your suggestions on addressing this kind of when these crises show up and we are left behind? What do we do? I think that's, that's the question. Again, it goes back to what we were discussing earlier. 
where you grab the narrative by the balls and you you you, you steer it towards a particular di 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 direction that uh, benefits you first as an individual or as a sector. I think what I was saying, Lydia, is people with disabilities really need to rise up. Let me just put it that way. Do you know that when you go to a bank as a person with a disability, you, you can't be uh, in, in, in the queue. Instead, you are moved to, to, to what you call this thing, to the, to the front of the queue. Why did people with disabilities allow government to then look at them as, 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 as not the first to be serviced, given that disability and, uh, in, in terms of a, 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 a pandemic like coronavirus can also expose us? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. There's not much I know about uh, pandemics, uh, but we are a vulnerable group. We should have been given preference. And I think people with disabilities missed the point and are still missing the point by not confronting government to say, how are we a vulnerable group yesterday? And when this happens, we are now just part of the flow. And, and I think part of what you were saying earlier is we achieved a lot in the early years because we were visible. We, exactly. we we forced people to see us. Now exactly. we we complain in in closed Facebook groups. We complain in polite letters, and we are not visible as a sector, and therefore it's easy to ignore us. But how how do you even begin to be ignored when you are eleven percent of the population? Don't you think we have not used our numbers as well? Do you know that 11% is a, is a, what they call this thing, is a, is a figure of the uh, official opposition in South Africa. Your DAs and your, and your what do you call it, your EFFs are, are rank at the 10%. And they are official oppositions. Imagine if we were to take that figure and translate it to our mobilization. Nobody would ever ignore us. The problem mm -hmm. with us is, as you say, we complain in our isolated silos. We are also very good at laughing like everything is is mojo on the third of december listening to almost one in the same speech every day do you know that i once went to dr zolim Kiza when he was still a, what do you call it premier of the province and i said how, how how do you even begin to say exactly what you said last year he looked at me and he said but what can we do i said maybe the problem is with us we're not giving you stories that are to be part of your, what you call this thing, of your of your official speech. People with disabilities have not submitted their stories. Not at all, to be very honest with you. We also are very not good at supporting each other. I mean, with 11%, this motor program should be one of the prime, what you call this thing, uh, prime platforms for expression. Because 11% of the population subscribes to, to, to the program or, 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 or join in the conversation. But you're going to discover that you are always not going to have a sizable audience because people with disabilities do not support one another. And we need to say that loud and clear. And I always ask myself, whoever thought that complaints bring any change? Complaints do not bring change. Actions bring change. Complaints yep. do not introduce you to anybody. They introduce your circumstances to, to a certain so. Stop complaining. Submit actions and you will be introduced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you've got a support in the room saying we start need to start, take ourselves seriously and work together in our seriousness in addressing it. I mean, there should not even be a single child with a disability that, 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 that does not go to school when we are 11% of the population. There should not be a single child. You know, Lydia, you know that I was giving uh, bursaries to children with disabilities uh, from 2005 up until 2018 when we closed in the Mesulu Trust. And people will always ask me, how did you manage to get funding, particularly from government? Because I was not, I was not asking. I was telling them that here are children with disabilities and they've passed. And do not tell me that they are, they, are, they are going to be part of your NSFAS mess at the end of the day, not even be given that bursary. Here, I, they, they, here they are, I've profiled them and you are going to give them those bursaries. And the very same language was spoken to the private sector. 
from 2005 all the way to 2018, Vusindimene and I managed to send to school anything up to 150 uh, children with disabilities. And it was all about mobilizing. Uh, well, when I'm talking about mobilizing, was mm -hmm. the trust, all the, tri the, the trustees were people with disabilities. The moment you are mobilized and you have a positive story to, 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 to give to people, and you are also not asking, but telling them, knowing that they are not going to, where, 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 where do you begin to say you cannot give me? Not my money, but money towards, towards the education of a child with a disability. And do you know mm -hmm. what happened, Lydia? Out of that uh, forcefulness, all of those children today are employed elsewhere. And it did not take us to find them employment. It just took us sending them to university, college, and all of that for them to find confidence in knowing that when they want, they will get. Seeing that people with disabilities need to train themselves as from today. Stop asking. Because in asking, you are, you are, you are, you are presenting people with a begging bowl. I'm not going to present anybody with a begging bowl when I'm, when I'm a bowl of, of, of ability. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. and this is mm -hmm. what people with disabilities that, that, that's, that, that's what changes the world. You're forcefully saying, I am here, fully qualified. Tell me why you are not going to recognize me. And those children were given those bursaries, books, accommodation, everything. And we almost attended every single one of their graduation ceremonies because those were products of force, not kids' gloves. I, I think it's a very important lesson. I was uh, preparing an advocacy training the other day, and I sort of went back into books around what is the art of persuasion, because that's what advocacy is. It's the art of yeah. persuasion. And rule number one is, do not even bother to open your mouth if you do not have an action that you are demanding. That's it. Doing advocacy, explaining what you call circumstance, is not advocacy, it's complaining. Doing advocacy with a begging bowl is not asking. It's not. It's not. It's not advocacy. Advocacy demands an action to be taken, and right. you, as the advocate, must determine what that action is. Mm -hmm. And then it's about persuading the other one that they are going to do it. Um, so it's really. I, mean, I think your your bursary scheme is a beautiful ex example of us not asking, because asking is favour. It's not a begging bowl. Mm. We are demanding justice. We are demanding our equality. We are demanding our, our opportunity. Um, and, 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 but we present people with a possibility of action. So exactly. ve very, very invaluable lesson, Musa. Hi, my name is Wayne. I work for an organization called Catholic NGO. And the three projects we should do are Ms. Fallon so basically, I'm a project manager for the protective workshop. Um, it's not really something, uh, a question I would like to ask. Um, something I, said, I would like to leave with the group and say, I think um, people's impairment has become too complicated. We have become too, uh, how do we expect um, society to take us? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, the thing I want to say is, how can we expect society take us seriously if we do not take ourselves seriously. So I think the time has come that we as people with payment need to take ourselves ourselves seriously. And I think we need to start standing together. And I have a motto which I love by because I'm a payment myself. And my motto that I love by every day is I refuse to let my payment determine the person I am and the person I still want to become. And that is something that drives me every single day. So I think we need to take ourselves seriously, very seriously, and stop, as you said, big. We need to start demanding. Because one of the issues I have is, why is it currently that we have the white paper, which is not, which is not signed off? Um, I think what's important, what Wayne is saying, is he's saying, unless we take ourselves seriously as disabled people, who, who else will take ourselves seriously? And it's not about begging for what is right. It's about demanding what is right. And he gives us an example and says, we've got the white paper. Um, and, and he calls what government hasn't signed off on as a legal instrument. In other words, we've got an approved white paper. That is a statement of intent. It's not, a, it's not an entitlement. And he is saying, 
why is it so difficult for government to change that into a law that gives us recourse if government doesn't do what they have promised to do in the constitution and, and, and what as a country we have committed to do. And, and that, that's Wayne's, in, but he says, unless we stand together and take ourselves seriously, we're not going to achieve that. But it's time that we stop asking and that we start demanding. Um, and I think that's what he says he takes from this um, talk. Uh, Musa, if we are really to take ourselves seriously, let's agree on this. And I know others are going to think, there he goes again. And, uh, again, uh, and trust me, there I go again. The first thing that we do is we go to television and we say, on the 3rd of December, which is International Day for People with Disabilities, we do not need a single government employee at whatever occasion that we're going to be holding. We just do not need them. They are going to ask, why would you say that when we're supposed to be making statements on your international day? And we will say to them, until you have signed that, then we will know that the statements that you are making about us our prospects and chances are not just word of mouth, but a law, but a law. Musa, what I hear you say is that until we claim our space back as disabled people and say that unless you are in this space with commitment and with guarantees, we do not need you in our space. What we've allowed is for government to push ourselves out of our own space claim that space without actually putting anything meaningful on the table. And what you're saying is that if we as disabled people claim our space and only allow you in, if you come with something that's meaningful, such as a law that gives us entitlements and hold you, you accountable. Am, I, am I hearing you correct? Exactly. And, and not the same speech as last year, because the, the speech is the same as last year, because nothing has been turned into law. So you, yeah. if we are to take ourselves seriously, there are some statements that we are going to have to make that are going to leave people uncomfortable. I'm telling you, no president in charge of a country would not take you seriously if you say, I don't want you at my party because you are not a part of me. You have not signed mm -hmm. me into law. You, you, you have not made everything about me something that other people should, should uh, mm -hmm. take seriously. I take myself very seriously. And I'm not going to have you coming here and fooling me with the same speech as last year and telling me that you are doing something about me when I'm not even a part of your laws. Musa, thank you so much. We're going to be getting to the end of the, the discussion. We will do this again. Um, and, 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 and we ask people that's part of the Disability Empowerment Facebook page to send us your input, send us who you want, send us what you want to discuss. This is really about reviving our mojo as a community and saying, how do we tap from our mojo and, and, and contribute in changing the society into a better society? Because for as long as we leave people behind, we are not a society that can flourish and that can thrive. We cannot thrive if we leave people, that people with potential, people with contribution in gutters. And I think that's really the message that Musa brings us. But Musa challenges us as, 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 as people with impairments, as people with disabilities, whatever you want to call yourself. And he is saying, stop being silent. Start placing the issues in the public space, but not as um, asks, as demands, as actions. Um, whether we do it on paper, whether we do it on film, whether we do it in poetry, whether we do it through song, place our issues, make ourselves be heard, and then support each other. And I think that's the other main message that I get from Musa. Musa is saying, I would not have been able to publish that thick book called I Am Art if I walked my journey alone. I supported people and people supported me. And that's what made us strong, getting me to this point. Um, and then I think there was a call from Musa saying, um, I am starting a new chapter in my life as I move forward. And there's a call of saying to action, saying to us, walk that path with me, for me, um, as I move my, move my next chapter along. Because 
if we don't look after ourselves, we cannot look after others. And I think that's why I, I started going into coaching. Because I think we have neglected ourselves in our quest for shouting out there and looking after others. And then we run empty. And when we have run empty, all action stops. All activism stops. And, and that's why it's so important that, that we nurture ourselves, that we feed our souls, that we discover our mojo, and that that drives us to bring about change, not only in our lives, but also in others' lives and in the country. Um, I, I'm going to post some information around a group coaching program that I'm going to lose. It's, it's partly to make it more affordable, but I think it is especially because we have seen the power that peer support brings about in the lives of people with disabilities. That when we can come together as people that are in the same situation, the same experiences, um, same challenges and same victories, we do so much better. Um, in the early days, we called it self-help groups. Um, we later called it foundations. But we come together as people to change our lives and other people's lives. Please, for those that's online, keep engaging. Um, keep content, making contact. Everybody that's here is on Facebook. Um, if, you, if you're too shy to, at this stage, shout out loud. Shout one-on-one -on -one until you get brave enough to shout out loud. And I think from me, let us use our mojo. Let us move forward. We are in this together. We are in this together as a country, as a community, and as a community within a community. Um, Musa, thank you so much. Enjoy your last days in Gauteng. Um, it's not such a bad place. Um, no, no. We, we don't have a sea, but we have lots of other things. So um, we, among others, have the economy. So make some moolah while you are here. Um, oh, I'm saying to Tabu and Debele and to Sarah Kla, um, Klaas, to you both for volunteering your services here. Thank you so much. Um, this is solidarity in, in making uh, uh, our broadcast accessible. Um, Musa. Once again, thank you. And to our guests that actually joined the Zoom room, um, you, you're part of our tribe. Um, and for those of us that have not yet bought Musa's latest book, but also his other books, um, drop Musa a note. Um, it's not that much money, guys. I see people say it's too much money. You can make down payments. You can make lay buys. But ultimately, if you leave the cigarettes and the beers for the next month, you can afford the book. Um, so please, it's, it's a book that will not make Musa rich, but it will make you rich, that I can guarantee you. So from my side, thank you so much for this month. Um, we'll see each other next month. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, very much. thank you. Thank you, Lydia. To make a difference means utilizing yourself with all other experiences to make someone else's life different from what it was yesterday. But I'm telling you, and as I end, you can't do it without making a difference in your own life. On the slide, there's some information on the group coaching program that we're launching, and we will do a separate post on that with all the information to enable you to sign up. I would like to specifically also thank my support team, Split Media Connection, Tabang Motahong, Definitive Brand, Kwezi Himtembu, both of them with uh, entrepreneurs with disabilities, as well as the Chart Your Path team led by Yusuf Mahomedi. Until next month, over and out.